Well, welcome everybody. Let's uh, get started with this evening's Green Talks. I'm Adrian Ramsey. I'm co-leader of the Green Party and I'm parliamentary candidate for the new constituency of Waveney Valley on the Norfolk Suffolk border. And I'm really looking forward to tonight's discussion. Uh, thank you very much to everybody for coming along. There's been a lot of interest in discussing these issues and we've got some fantastic speakers joining us. So we've come to discuss the issue of why we're increasingly seeing food shortages in the supermarket shelves uh, and so much more to do with sustainability or the lack of it in our food system. Um, and the issues here are many and require us to look at the fragility of our food systems through the lens of climate justice, green farming and systems change. I'm joined by a panel of expert speakers today who will present their own viewpoints and share with us how they think we can solve the food shortages. In a moment, I'll introduce you to the panellists, but first let's just go through a few bits of housekeeping. So the event tonight will start with a panel discussion and then later on uh, from around seven o'clock, we'll have a question and answer session for the last half an hour. Um, you can put your questions as you think of them into the Q&A box and then people can vote for the ones that you most want to hear answered. And the questions with the most votes will go to the top and have a higher chance of being asked later on. If you have any technical questions to do with the running of the webinar, then you can put them into the chat box for our moderators to answer directly. So to introduce our panel, I'm joined today by George Monbiot, author, columnist and environmental activist. Uh, we also have Jocelyn Longdon, uh, academic, climate justice activist and founder of Climate in Colour. And of course, Natalie Bennett, Green Party peer and former leader of the Green Party in England and Wales. So um, welcome to you all. Thanks to everybody for joining. We're going to start off with a, an opening question, which I'll ask all of the panel to join in with. Um, and um, this is really to to look at the background to the to this issue. So why have we seen growing numbers of examples in, in recent months of our shelves being empty? What's the reason behind the food shortages that we've been experiencing? Um, and it'd be good to explore that. Let's kick off with Natalie. Well, thank you very much, Adrian, and it's great to be with everyone tonight. Um, and um, of course, there's one thing you have to start with when we're talking about the food shortages, which is the issue of Brexit. A huge amount of our fresh uh, vegetables and fruit um, have been imported from the European Union. That's become more complicated and difficult. And when supplies have come under pressure um, in the European Union, uh, they've just gone, Britain's too difficult, it's too much of a pain, um, we're not gonna do it. And we also have um, supermarkets which squeeze down the price, operate very much on fixed price contracts whereas systems operate differently in continental Europe and farmers are actually paid more reflecting their real costs. But also I think it's worth noting where those shortages are. Those shortages are very much happening in, as you said, Adrian, the supermarkets. We haven't seen corner stores, we haven't seen box schemes, we haven't seen local grocers where they still exist having problems. Where we have localised, strong, independent systems, they've kept going just fine. But despite that, of course, we also do have a problem in terms of um, the costs for farmers are rising. I talked about how supermarkets have squeezed and squeezed and squeezed down our farmers, particularly the smaller independent family farms. Uh, farmers get only 6% um, on average of the supply chain. So if you've spent a pound in the supermarket, on average, farmers have got 6p of that. Um, and so as we've seen energy costs rise, and this has particularly affected things like um, uh, where, where uh, vegetables and fruit are grown in greenhouses in the UK. Um, that's been a huge issue. And of course, we're also seeing many difficulties for farmers with our changing climate, all of the pressures of the climate emergency, uh, drought and flooding rains. Anyone who's wondering where my accent comes from, it's from Australia, a part of the world that's famous for drought and flooding rains. And yet we're increasingly seeing that sort of thing in the UK and across continental Europe as well. Um, and we've just got essentially a broken food system, a food system that's not ensuring our own sec food security. And it's interesting that the UK historically, not just in recent years, but actually over the past couple of centuries, has relied on the rest of the world to feed it. We haven't been food sufficient, self-sufficient uh, for centuries. The Industrial Revolution happened 
and we exploited lots of different parts of the world, notably India, um, before that um, Ireland, um, and we took food out of other people's mouths. We relied on their labour, we relied on their water to feed ourselves. And that's really now increasingly becoming an unsustainable system. So we have a broken food system. It isn't food secure. And we're just seeing the very start of, of where we are likely to be in the future if we don't change direction. And I think you know one final thought that I'll finish with was um, uh, Boris Johnson. You will remember him a couple of prime ministers back. Um, uh, you know, it said about a year ago that um, he wasn't worried about food security because that was a job for the supermarkets. And we have a government that hasn't acknowledged that food security and the quality of our food and the affordability of our food is very much the government's business. And we're seeing the results of that. Thanks very much. Thank you, Natalie. Really interesting opening remarks. Um, so looking forward to hearing from our other two panellists. And Jocelyn, would you like to come in next? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, I think some of the things I might uh, be repeating from Natalie, but I think um, the current food shortages we're seeing, of course, um, yeah, Brexit has a play with that as well, but also most notably because of the rise in energy bills after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But coming from a climate perspective, the, the impacts of weather extremes in places like Spain, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, um, that are being directly impacted by the worsening climate crisis and that were there prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, and I think it's important to mention that because the climate crisis is a threat multiplier. So whilst there might be these world events that we can start blaming for um, uh, impacts um, on communities, that is always going to be exasperated by the climate crisis. And the climate crisis will expose any vulnerabilities or insecurities that currently exist in our global food um, global systems such as the food system um our food is currently being interconnected and as natalie mentioned the uk is is very far away from being self-sufficient we actually import 48 percent of the total food that we consume here and that proportion is rising and this means that any shocks to food production either from political um or climate crises um will have a direct effect effect on the food that we can access and so it's understanding that the uk is um, part of a very large network um, and, and are going to be vulnerable to political and, and climate events. Thanks, Jocelyn. Um, George. Um, thank you, Adrian. And um, look, everything Natalie and Jocelyn have said is true, but there's a much bigger issue which very, very few people have got their heads around. What we're experiencing in the UK is the merest ripple of a much bigger global problem. And it's a problem which sits below the issues we've been hearing about so far. The, the, the greatest threat to the global food system is the global food system. And, and it faces the same kind of systemic instability and the possibility of collapse that the financial system faced in the, in the 2000s. Um, and for exactly the same reasons, um, which is um, extreme corporate concentration, um, uh, global homogenization and standardization of, of trade, of seeds, of pesticides, of all the rest of it, which in systems terms, uh, alongside many other issues bearing upon it, means that you get oversized nodes in the system and two strong connections between those nodes and between the subsidiary nodes in the system. That, that's how a systems theorist would see it. Um, the, the maths of, of complex systems has got to the point where you don't even need to know what the system is to know whether it's going to collapse or not, to know whether it's fragile or resilient. You, you just have to look at the basic maths of, of its nodes and its links. And when you look at the maths of the food system, as scientists have been doing now for, 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 for several years, you will see an extremely alarming picture of a system which looks uh, extremely prone to collapse. Now, uh, until 2014, there was a, a general optimism about solving world hunger. Um, there, there was a widespread view that we were going to hit Sustainable Development Goal 2.1, which is a, an end to hunger worldwide, um, because um, uh, levels of chronic hunger had 
broadly been falling all the way from the 1960s until 2014, even though number of people was rising, the amount of food um, and its distribution was was improving faster than, than, than population growth. And then in 2015, we saw that trend start to turn. And, and the number of chronically hungry people has been rising ever since. Now, people look at COVID, they look at uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and there's no question that those issues have exacerbated um, that, that trend of rising chronic hunger, um, alongside, of course, the climate shocks and other environmental shocks um, that, that Jocelyn has mentioned. But, um, but the trend was there already. And the extraordinary thing about that transition between 2014 and 2015 was that um, it coincided with a global decline in the price of food. In fact, a very sharp drop from a global food price index um, in 2014 of 115 to um, a price index of 93 in, in 2015. So there'd been a very sharp drop in the price of food. And the price of food stayed historically low until 2020. So for the first five years of that trend, we saw low food prices and rising hunger. And any economist would tell you that's impossible. You can't have that situation. And the reason for it seems to be systemic instability. That as the system has lost its resilience, even quite small shocks, instead of being damped down as a healthy complex system does, were instead exacerbated and amplified across that system. And they didn't hit us in the rich world very hard because we stand at the front of the queue. We've got hard currencies to buy in a, in a hard currency commodity market. They hit the poor nations much harder. And so a small disruption caused by a speculative surge on one commodity, caused by one nation imposing an export ban, for example, caused by a particular climate shock in one region of the world, that instead of being um, damped down and equalized as a, as a healthy, resilient, complex system will do, it gets amplified across the system. And what we've seen are all the signs of what systems theorists call flickering, which is that as a system approaches its tipping point, its output values start to fluctuate wildly. And we're seeing this in a whole series of indicators to do with food. It looks about 2006 in the financial system. That, that's more or less where we are in the food system. But almost no one is across this issue. No one seems to understand it. No one who understands it, and the very few, seems to be able to get the ear of the media or the ear of policymakers. It's an absolute catastrophe in the making. If the global financial system had collapsed, and remember governments bailed it out at the 11th hour, it would have caused massive um, disruption and dislocation for billions of people. But if the global food system collapses, I mean, it just doesn't bear thinking about. Um, and, and while governments were able to bail out the financial system at the 11th hour by creating future money, you cannot bail out the food system by creating future food. This is one of the great, one of the five great existential issues on earth, I believe. It's up there with environmental breakdown, with nuclear war, um, with AI and, and with new um, infectious diseases. And yet almost no one is talking about it. There's um, a, an essay on my website, monvio.com, called The Hunger Gap which um, looks at what the scientific evidence is on this issue and is desperately trying to raise the alarm about something that almost no one in public life is talking about. Thank you. Well, thank you, George, and, and to all the panellists for your initial analysis there. And clearly there are major systemic issues that you're all identifying. And uh, what we want to do now is to start to unpick those and look at solutions. Now, Natalie, I think you're wanting to come back in on some of those initial points. And if, if you could start also to address how do we start to create a less fragile food system? Where do we go from here? Sure. Well, just sort of pick up the points that George made about nodes and about fragility and lack of resilience in the system. Um, I actually learned about this, gosh, it must have been six or seven years ago from a Canadian academic called Jennifer Clapp. I'll stick a link in, the, in, in a minute. 
um, who is really good on looking at the concentration of, of big companies owning huge parts of the food system. So it used to be there was a big six fertilizer companies, a big six seed companies, uh, a big six manufacturing companies. And what's gradually happened is that that's actually come down to big five, big four. There's more and more concentration. And in fact, even lots of Americans are coming at this from the kind of trust perspective. Uh, and those systems that you are, um, if, if, if people are dominating a huge pound, you're relying on that one company. But more than that, very interestingly, is actually uh, Jennifer Clapp does some really interesting work looking on how, if you look at BlackRock, for example, the hedge fund owns 10% of each one of those big four in each one of those keys areas. And another couple of three or four hedge funds own another 10%. So there's essentially, as George was, I think you was referring to, it's all very tightly interlinked. It's all locked in the same kind of system. And the other thing to say in the other way in which there's a lack of variety and a lack of resilience is we are incredibly dependent. More than 50 percent of human calories come from just four food crops. And that's incredibly dangerous. If you suddenly have a, have a rust, a wheat disease sweeping across the world and you have very few varieties of wheat, mostly, mostly you're growing the same varieties of wheat and they get taken out by that, and wheat is a huge percentage of your um, your food supplies, um, then that's all part of the problem, it's the problems that George was identifying. So I think what you know, the answer in a way is kind of obvious, do the opposite to everything we're doing now. And my answer and the Green Party's answer to this is that we have to go back to the small scale, the local um, and variety. And you know, we, we need to start with vegetables and fruit. That's essential for human health. We're far too relied on commodity and ultra processed manufactured food. We go back to vegetables and fruit as the foundation, locally grown, relying on lots of different local varieties. And if people are looking for a case study of the kind of ways this can be done in um, not very far from your territory, Adrian, uh, Wakelands Agroforestry, a wonderful uh, case study that's been operating for decades, looking at how you can have um, grow arable crops and they have land races. So there's a variety of say wheat, um, they're developing one single wheat crop that's these land races that has lots of variety within it. And you keep going with that land race rather than one single genetic variety. And you have trees growing in rows or hedges in rows down across the field. And that is, as a general rule of thumb, agroforestry is a third um, more um, more productive than is um, uh, if you're just growing at one level. These are the kind of permaculture principles. And these are the kind of things that we need to do, go towards crop diversity, human diversity, system diversity, um, built on what works in local areas. And that you know, is essentially where the Green Party starts, saying that we have to end the food waste that is factory farming, uh, that we have to end artificial fertilizer use, end nearly all pesticide use, um, work essentially in an agro ecological uh, system. So we work with nature instead of trying to cosh it into submission. So that's just a short answer to a very big question. Thanks, Adrian. Well, thank you, Natalie. And yes, Wakelands is indeed in the Waveney Valley constituency, and I, I visited that among other agroforestry and, and um, nature friendly farming examples of which there's lots in Suffolk and Norfolk um, and I know we all want to see more so thank you for out, outlining that that vision. Um, just to keep the discussion going around the panel, George I'd be interested in your thoughts either in response to Natalie or in terms of mm. how, how do we counter these major systemic challenges that you and the other panellists have outlined? Sure, Th thank you Adrian. Well, um, uh, Natalie is quite right about fruit and vegetables, and and there's every reason to be growing far more of our fruit and vegetables at home. But we are still highly reliant on grain, and will remain highly reliant on grain. Um, the um, just the four big grains alone uh, account for about sixty percent of the world's calories, and that means that um, most countries are highly reliant on international trade. Um, we're quite lucky in the UK, you know, we've got relatively large um, amount of agricultural land by comparison to our population. Many parts of the world do not have that. And food localism alone cannot solve this problem simply because of, well, maths, really. Um, people tend to live in very large, dense communities. Um, the majority of the world's populations live in cities. 
most cities do not have a sufficient hinterland of agricultural quality land to feed their populations. There was a paper in Nature Food um, showing that um, uh, the average minimum distance over which the world's people can be fed is 2,200 kilometers. Um, and for people depending on cereals, it's 3,800 kilometers. Um, so, you know, we do depend on these vast, lightly habited lands like the US Midwest, where Canadian prairies, the Brazilian interior, the Ukrainian Chernozem, the Russian steppes for a really huge amount of our food. And even if we in the UK are not importing that food directly, any constraint on, on that production and trade is going to affect us. But actually, you know, we should be thinking globally, of course, and we should be most concerned about those who are most vulnerable to food shocks, um, who are generally the people living in the poorest nations, uh, many of which do not have sufficient fertile land and water to feed their own people. So, you know, while food localism is, is something we should definitely pursue where and when we can, it cannot be a universal answer. Um, we, we have to try to reintroduce to this very fragile system um, the six crucial elements of systemic um, re resilience. Natalie's um, talked about one of them, and it's a very important one, which is diversity. We need to re-diversify our food systems. Um, we also need to re reintroduce asynchronicity, um, which means you know trying to get away from a system where everybody's doing exactly the same thing at the same time, just as in banking, that turns out to be extremely dangerous. We need more redundancy in the system as every corporation has pursued its efficiency goals. Um, they've reduced the, the redundancy in the system as a whole. We need circuit breakers, which means effective regulation, which um, uh, can stop shocks from being amplified across the system. We need what systems theorists call modularity, which is a compartmentalization of the system so that a shock can't be easily transferred. And we need backup systems, wholly new ways of doing things. And there's no one simple cut out answer which is going to meet those those demands. Um, we have to see this from a systems perspective. In fact, you know, we need the systems perspective in almost everything we do, and yet it's lacking in almost everything. You know, that there's no uh, education in complex systems. You know, unless you're doing a specialist degree, you're going to have no exposure to how complex systems work at any point in your education. And yet everything important to us, the human brain, the human body, human society, every ecosystem, the atmosphere, the oceans, financial system, the food system, every major human system, the ice shelves, you name it, is a complex system. And we're constantly taken by surprise by complex systems because we don't understand how they work. Thanks, George. And yes, we're very much keen to delve into this more this evening, appreciating the importance of, of really understanding the system. And, and to delve into one area of this more, you started to talk about the international dimension to this and the need to address uh, international inequity in the food system. And, and Jocelyn, I know this is an area that you're particularly interested in. So from an international perspective, how do we go about addressing inequity in the food system and do you want to expand on on how you see those issues yeah thank you i mean um george you know sort of started to mention it but and in and in response to george what you were saying earlier about the system that at the issues with the food system itself i mean the dominant food model prioritizes production and profit over people um and this the current system that we're working with use food as a commodity um, and is driven by monocultural. So as, as Natalie was also saying, these single um, crops. Um, and, and there's a very industrial perception of food um, with little regard for global, regional and local differences and nuances in food consumption. And I'll mention it a little bit later, but this comes into conversations around not just food justice, but food sovereignty and how communities are able to grow their own locally um, appropriate or culturally appropriate foods to sustain their communities rather than this sort of large-scale production of food in the US being imported, say, into African countries. Um, but the result of this kind of system is, is, is um, huge inequality. 
So about half of the population in low income um, countries experience food insecurity compared to only 10% in, in high income countries uh, like the UK. Um, and almost 40% of the global population are dependent on agriculture as their main source of income, um, as their main profession. And uh, these communities create uh, around 50% of the world's food. Um, and to dive in a little bit more, a third of the food that is supplied globally comes from um, a majority of farms that are less than two hectares, uh, hectares large. And so here we see that not only are those producing our food most affected by food insecurity, but also these shocks that we're talking about, these political shocks and most uh, commonly climate shocks, drought, flooding, um, uh, disease um, that affects crops, impacts many, many very, very small farms um, in the global south. Yeah. But this impact isn't just uh, folks in the global south and the most marginalised and vulnerable communities in the UK also experience food insecurity. Um, food prices in the UK have increased by 19.1%. Um, in the last 12 months to March 2023. And this has been the sharpest jump since August 1977. Um, and, and one concept that's really important to think about in terms of inequality in the UK, this is also very prevalent in the US, is the idea of a food desert. So Anati was mentioning, you know, fresh fruit and vegetable, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables. And these food deserts are areas where people have complete lack of access to fresh fruit and vegetables. Um, there's a high prevalence of corner shops, um, of uh, convenience stores that are less likely to stock fresh produce um, that can spoil, more likely to stock, um, you know, uh, canned food, packaged goods, um, and, and also more expensive. So when you think about it, both from a nutrition perspective, but also from, from a financial perspective, um, provide quite a lot of inequality for, for these communities. And so... I think when we look at inequality in the, in, in, in the food system, we can see that the aggressive industrial um, monocultured way of producing food does not only impact, you know, people in the global south, but again, because it's a massive network and it's a complex system, also communities in the UK those who are most vulnerable are experiencing the worst sides of it. And so when, you know, governments talk about, economic stability etc the current food system right now doesn't serve any of that it, it doesn't serve stability in any sense of the word because if we continue on these quite extractive um, aggressive um, forms of um, uh, agriculture that are ruining the soils that are making it more likely for further climate impacts to affect yields and to affect the amount of food that's being produced um, it's it's just sort of we're uh, in a, a constant cycle of making the situation worse and actually not solving inequality for anyone. Um, so I'll stop there for now. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Lots of uh, really valuable insights there. And I know we'll all identify with the points we've made about rising food prices really worsening the cost of living crisis and it having gone from a crisis where people were particularly noticing the pinch in terms of energy bills and of course mortgages but now um you know food prices um are, are a significant part of that uh, and we know that um people on lower incomes are, are worse affected by that and and have least access to healthier food so there's definitely a, a strong social justice element to this story both at home and internationally I could see Natalie and George both nodding along to parts of what you were saying so I'll ask you both to if you want to to come back in on, on the justice aspect of this, both domestically and internationally. George, did you want to come back in first? I, I thought Jocelyn made some really great points there. Um, and, you know, to eat a healthy diet costs five times as much as to eat one which is merely adequate in terms of calories. Um, and we have um, a, a system which is so grossly unequal and unjust that huge numbers of people are condemned to eating an unhealthy diet. Um, uh, in surveys, a remarkable proportion of, of politicians um, believe that obesity is a question of a, of, of a loss of willpower. Um, I mean, it's just it's just an extraordinary thing. It's like, so, oh, has a whole nation lost its willpower um, in, in the course of a generation? Uh, obesity is 
a communicable disease and its vectors are corporations. Um, and it is exacerbated massively by extreme inequality. As Jocelyn talks about, you know, creating food deserts, creating just a lack of opportunity to have a healthy diet, however desperately you might want one. Um, it's 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 created in the first instance by terrible food being produced by corporations and then very heavily advertised and pushed. Um, and then the closure of opportunities to have much better food. And, and Justin's absolutely right. You know, at heart, this is a justice issue and terrible injustice is being served up day after day on huge numbers of people. Adrian, if I can just jump in there and pick up some figures I was just looking at today. Um, in 1980 in the UK, the rate of obesity among men and women was nine and it was six and nine percent respectively. In 2019, the figures were 27 and 29 percent. Um, as George is saying, it's not that we've all suddenly lost willpower. What's happened is we've entirely changed the environment. And one of the things that I was actually, I actually had a small bit of progress today in the House of Lords, just over the road from where I'm talking to you, uh, was partly because I had a, um, I was, it was a whip rather than the minister who was less well briefed on everything he was talking about. And I got put up and pointed out that the globe around the Western world in particular, but also it's spreading around the whole of the world because the, the terrible diets we have in the global north are spreading very fast to the global south as well. Um, ultra processed foods, um, a particular category, um, the rate of what's known as early onset cancer, which is people in their uh, 40s, their 30s and increasingly their 20s are getting cancer and the best explanation for this is the change in diets, the move towards ultra processed diets and the impact that's having on our microbiome, which is a whole another fascinating area. And one of my projects in life is to get the government to acknowledge that ultra processed food is actually a category. And um, we have well over half of the British diet by calories comes from ultra processed food which essentially often should not be described as food, but should be described as food-like substances, formulated to be terribly Moorish, uh, to, to not fill you up. And people are actually craving nutrition uh, and not getting it. I wrote for Molly Scott Cato when she was our MEP for the Southwest, a report um, called Rich Earth. I'll drop the link into the chat in a second. Um, and um, one of the things that that really focused on is how little we've looked at We've grown food, we've thought about the calories, we've thought about the profit we're getting from a crop. There's been almost no thought about how much nutrition you're getting. And I only found one really good Chinese survey that compared uh, an acre or a hectare of land, different kind of crops, and how much actual nutrition you got. You know, both major nutrients, but also micronutrients and what you get out of them. And we've just basically there's been an absolute collapse in the nutritional quality of food. Uh, we get that we're getting far more calories than we need while not really being fed. This is such an enormous issue and you've all made really um, insightful points about the complex systems behind it, which of course are not easy to unpick. But Natalie's just highlighted one quite specific area of policy around ultra processed foods that could be tackled. Um, Jocelyn, George, if, if you were to highlight one or two specific policy areas that if our government was start to start to get to grips with this issue, that it should pursue, where where would you where would you start on this? Um, who wants to come in next on that? Jocelyn, go go go, go first, please. Great, hey, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, when I think about food justice policies, I think about availability of that food, access to that food, how that food can be used and also the stability of that food. So I think part of it is a justice aspect and part of it's a climate aspect. How are we make, taking action on the climate crisis? This isn't a direct policy, but of course the food system is um, reliant on having a, a, a healthy climate and not being impacted by climate shocks. So what action are governments taking um, on fossil fuels, on um, the way that our food is produced and in reducing the impacts of the climate crisis? And on the other side, um, thinking about access to food. So regulation of corporations, regulation on um, supermarkets and, and how supermarkets price food, and also, again, going back to the food deserts um, uh, option, what policy is there around a community having three or four fast food chains and no supermarket or no grocers or no local locally produced food? Um, and just to sneak a last one in, 
I think we do need to improve local British grown vegetables, food and vegetables, and to reduce that 48% back down in terms of um, uh, reliance on export, on, yeah, on import. Um, yeah, I think I would endorse all that and say, look, we need something um, which covers really the whole economy, but is particularly relevant in, in the food sector. We urgently need to bring in much stronger antitrust laws than we have. We have to break up the big corporations. Um, we, we have also to um, stop them exerting a grip over the food chain with their extreme intellectual property rights. Antitrust law should be strong, intellectual property rights should be weak. And that applies to everyone, you know, whether you're talking about Amazon, whether you're talking about Meta, whether you, you, you're talking about Cargill or Tesco or whoever it might be. And, and we're in this situation where corporations have been allowed to get so big and so powerful that they actually become harder and harder to contain and their corporate lobbying becomes more and more powerful to the extent um, to which we as voters, even collectively, seem to count for much less than those corporations count. Now, we urgently do need to do this with the existing system, and just as urgently, we need to do it to prepare for new food systems, because we are going to need new food systems. In fact, we're going to need new sources of food. Uh, in one of the greatest looming threats, which is driving so much of, of, of the rest of what we're facing, is the increase in consumption of livestock products. And that is driven by a really hardwired human tendency called Bennett's Law. Not, not Natalie Bennett's Law, a different Bennett, but um, Bennett's Law states that as people become more prosperous, they want more energy dense foods, particularly richer in, in protein and fat. And at the moment, livestock's been supplying that. Um, the um, global average livestock con con consumption is about half that of our average um, consumption, but it's converging rapidly towards ours. We just can't afford to keep eating like this. You know, it's livestock which is crushing the life out of this planet just as much as fossil fuels. Um, um, people talk about overpopulation and they mean humans, but actually human population is about the only environmental index which, which is flattening out. It's now less than 1% a year growth. The real population crisis is livestock population, which is growing at 2.4% a year. Already we kill 76 billion animals a year. We have to find new ways of producing the protein rich foods that people want uh, with, um, with lower amounts of processing, healthy foods, uh, which don't depend on this mass exploitation of animals and the huge environmental impacts that they carry. And I think there's enormous potential in developing unicellular um, production. You know, we've been concentrating on multicellular organisms, plants and animals for 12,000 years, and we've neglected the enormous potential of unicellular organisms, which you can grow with far lower environmental impacts. But in order to do that, um, uh, in, in ways which don't then reinforce the current tendencies in the food system, we have to break up the corporations. We can't allow um, corporations to do to any new food system we introduce what they've done to the old food systems. Um, um, you know, many of these new technologies are being developed with out of public universities. They've already been publicly funded, but here we are allowing private corporations to then nobble the intellectual property and claim exclusive rights to it. It, it's simply wrong. You know, there, there's a tendency in some parts of the Green Party to say we don't like these new technologies at all. And let's face it, um, environmentalists as a whole are pretty neophobic. But the problem is not with the technologies, it's with ownership and control of technologies. You know, just as with global trade, global grain trade, you know, 90 percent of the global grain trade is in the hands of four corporations. The, the answer is not to ban the global grain trade, because that would instantly lead to billions starving. It's to break up those corporations. And that's what we have to do in every single sector within the food system, but also in the economy as a whole. Thank you, George. And um, we're starting to touch on some of the subjects that have been quite common in the questions. We will get to the, the, the questions soon. But uh, factory farming has been highlighted there, and, and you've George talked about the the impacts of intensive farming um, and suggested some potential solutions to that. I can tell there may be a bit of a discussion around uh, your suggested solution, but just on on the problems first of all. I mean, we think of ourselves as a, a nation of 
animal lovers in the UK, and there's lots of reasons to think that is the case. But you highlighted that the number of animals um, that are um, being housed in, in appalling conditions in factory farms is only growing, and, and some of the impacts that that has environmentally and health-wise and so on. Do you want to just expand on the problem first before we before we then delve into different views on the solutions? Did you want me to do that or, or uh, if, we go to one of the that, others? Then I'll just keep, oh, keep oh. Yet. Okay, so sorry, I got a bit distracted by one of the questions about wild venison. So um, um, maybe allow Jocelyn or, or Natalie to, to yeah, to please do absolutely. I'll, I'll come back to it. Okay, well, uh, in terms of factory farming, perhaps if I can jump in on that one, um, I, I've got a favourite little game that I play in the House of Lords. We have something called the long table, where you, if you're eating dinner, you just sit beside the next person who's sitting there. And I get them started on the conversation of discussing about how food waste, and I've seen some comments in the question about that, how food waste is a terrible thing. And, you know, I'll get the most right wing Tory. Everyone agrees that food waste is a terrible thing. Uh, and then I point out that feeding perfectly good grains, oils and proteins like soya to animals to produce a much smaller quantity of food at the other end and a huge amount of waste is actually wasting food at which point the uh, agreement at the table breaks down rather spectacularly. But I think that's one of the arguments to make about food waste. The other thing, and I saw one or two people from um, uh, over in uh, uh, Ellie Chown's territory over in Herefordshire uh, were, were uh, noting they're on the call. Of course, the River Y is the extreme case study of this, mm -hmm. is that factory farming produces huge amounts of waste, um, which ends up causing water pollution and air pollution and nitrogenous air pollution is, is one of those big growing areas of environmental concern, which is going to become bigger and bigger. Uh, and one of the issues about factory farming too, which I actually think will be the thing that will stop factory farming, is the practical fact that uh, factory farming, even in the UK, where they've done a lot to try and reduce it, uses large quantities of antibiotics. Now, we have a huge problem with antibiotic resistance. We risk losing uh, our antibiotics and with them losing modern medicine. And this is something I do a great deal of work on with some um, interns from the British Society for Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. I'll actually be in the John Innes Institute in Norfolk, um, in Norwich in a couple of weeks, um, talking at an event on antimicrobial resistance. Basically factory farming, which originated the last swine flu outbreak was almost certainly the source of the current avian flu outbreak that's causing huge uh, damage now in our wildlife, wildfowl population, wild bird populations. Um, it's actually factory farming health wise, we cannot afford it. Pollution wise, we cannot afford it. And in terms of food waste, we can't afford it. And if we're thinking about how much land we need and what we're using land for, 50% of arable land, so land we're um, putting crops into now, in Britain um, goes into either factory feeding factory farm animals or uh, some of it into biofuels. In America, the figure is something like 75% of land. If we stop doing that, if we just stop factory farming, we would have such a massive amount of more capacity to use that food to feed ourselves. Thank you. Um, Jocelyn, did you want to expand further on the challenges relating to factory farming, particularly in, from an international perspective, before we come on to look at different solutions? Yeah, I mean, I think George and Nessie have covered quite, quite a lot of the main points. Um, I think that from my experience being in Ghana and, and, and looking at how things are done there on a larger scale, I wouldn't say that my experience has seen this, this sort of intense factory farming and intense, it seems that most of the movement is coming from say South America, um, huge amounts of deforestation. And I think for me, my interest is in conservation and in forest conservation. And we also need to look at how this sort of mass production of food for animals does um, uh, impact uh, not only ecosystems, but also then the climate system loop. Um, and so seeing it, at it, seeing it from all of these different perspectives and, and factory farming is a climate issue. It's a it's a large cause of the climate crisis. And so just like, as George said, fossil fuels needs to be tackled. This is also something that needs to be tackled. Thanks to both Jocelyn and Natalie, because I, I think you've made some really great comments there. Um, I would say the there is no good way of producing animal products for large numbers of people. Um, and Jocelyn and Natalie have, have, have 
very beautifully set out the problems with intensive animal farming, which we call quite rightly factory farming, because the great majority of our animal products come from things which are basically factories and they're hideous, they're terrible, they're highly polluting, extremely damaging and just awful for the animals we keep in them. If we kept cats and dogs in the way that we keep pigs and chickens, we would literally be sent to, sent to prison. And yet we've normalized and naturalized this extraordinary mass slaughter and, and mass mal maltreatment to these intelligent animals. But many people, including, as I see from the chat, some greens, um, think that the alternative to intensive livestock keeping is extensive livestock keeping. And if, if there's one thing worse in environmental terms than intensive livestock keeping, it's extensive livestock keeping. And the reason for that is, well, there's a clue in the name. Extensive means that you're using more land um, for per kilogram of, of produce. And land is or should be among our most important environmental metrics. It should be right up there with greenhouse gas emissions as something we're constantly looking at. Because every hectare of land you use for extractive commercial purposes is a hectare of land that can't be used to support wild ecosystems. The great majority of the world's species depend on wild ecosystems for their survival. Wild ecosystems almost invariably contain far more carbon than any managed ecosystem. Um, Earth systems themselves depend on wild ecosystems. But by far and away, the greatest assault on wild ecosystems, because it's the greatest of all human uses of land, is grazing for cattle and sheep. Um, and, and we, you know, as, as Greens, we say, oh, we love to see cattle and sheep out in the pastures. It's beautiful. Um, and and we, we put our aesthetic, highly culturally conditioned um, um, impulses above what the numbers are showing us. Um, and the numbers are showing us very clearly this is an absolute environmental catastrophe. It's been a catastrophe for indigenous people. Um, cattle and sheep ranching have, have historically been and remain the major drivers of dispossession and expulsion of indigenous people from their lands. They also have historically been and remain the greatest drivers of the transformation of habitats. They are destroying habitats all over the world and they're preventing the regeneration, the rewilding of habitats in, in places where um, uh, cattle and sheep ranching is longer established. If we're going to get through this century, um, we, we're going to need a great rewilding. It's the only thing now which is going to stop the sixth great extinction, which is going to stop the collapse of Earth systems and can draw down significant amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And the only way we're going to have that is to move out of animal products, particularly ruminant animal products, cattle and sheep. They are by far and away per kilo of product, but also in absolute terms, by far and away the most damaging of all the food, uh, the major food products that we eat. Um, and, and, you know, this romantic idea that pasture fed meat is the way forward. It, it might be if we had several planets and no space for wild ecosystems on any of them, but because of the enormous land demand, because it's such an inefficient system, it needs huge amounts of land to produce tiny amounts of food, which is why, you know, lamb produces just 1% of all the UK's food and yet occupies an area greater than the area for all the grain that we grow and has denuded all our uplands. Um, this is the worst possible way to go about producing our food. And, and, and if you're going to start with transformation of the food system, you must start with getting out of the farming of ruminant animals. Interesting thoughts, George, and I'm sure we'd all agree about the crucial importance of restoration of nature being right near the top of the public policy agenda. Um, I think I could tell earlier that there was going to be some discussion around around the vision that you've outlined in terms of what that means for farming. I'd be interested to hear hear um, thoughts from the other panellists. Uh, Natalie, did you want to come in next and then Jocelyn? Yes, I, I think um, at Foundation we're having a very basic debate here um, and it comes down to what's known as the sparing versus sharing um, debate. The question is whether we spare some of our land, rewild it, just leave it to go wild um, and essentially certainly the, the, um, the, the, the Tories with whom I have this, this debate quite often in the House of Lords uh, seek we trash the hell out of the, out, of, out of the remaining bits. So you spare some and trash the rest our vision, the, the foundation of the Green Party vision is um, sharing um, so that if we look after every inch of the land, 
and I think this is a particularly, you know, the context of this is I'm talking here about what happens in the UK. I think Jocelyn can perhaps talk about on the world scale. And of course, there are very significant communities on a world scale who are traditionally pastoralists who operate in, in environments where um, that's the only essential way in which you can raise food and the whole history of what those pastoralists have done. And I've just been reading about the Scythians back in the time of ancient Greece and early China. And it's absolutely fascinating, the, Mongol, the Mongols, um, there's, there's a whole fascinating history, but I'm going to park all of the international stuff and perhaps Jocelyn might like to pick some of that up and just focus on the, in the UK context. And um, there are many um, farming systems that involve small um, quantities of animals being involved in those systems, using the manure from those systems. And I'm just going to stick in the chat now, the, um, the Eat Well um, planetary diet, which there's been a great deal of work on recently, and that has a tiny fraction uh, of meat and dairy products. And I think I want to stress that, you know, what we're talking about, and George was talking about where protein comes from, and I, I want to focus on the, on the positive, perhaps we'll get more onto positive quite soon, but you know, a great example is, is a wonderful company called Hodbedods, which actually spout, spun out of transition uh, Norfolk, and they're growing, you know, George was talking about protein-rich foods, uh, Hodmedods, and, and if you're wondering where the word comes from, and I'll, I'll stick it in the chat as soon as I get a chance, it's the dialect word for hedgehog, and it's spun out of um, a transition group in uh, Norfolk, uh, and they're growing huge numbers of increasing amounts and a great variety of um, beans and pulses in the UK, um, and you're bringing back crops. Um, uh, badger beans was something that was a huge crop 150 years ago, and Hodmodods are the people who are bringing it back. So what we're talking about are mixed systems in which there's a very small number of, of animals um, producing a, a small amount of meat products as part of um, uh, agroecological um, permaculture style systems. And that really is the vision that, that, that the Green Party is putting forward. Thank you, Natalie. That's the second positive example you've quoted from East Anglia with Hodmodods, who I also know. Um, Jocelyn, it'd be really interesting your take, particularly from an international perspective again. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, both 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 points are um, really, really important. And I think that the main thing to consider is that what might be absolutely disastrous in the UK or the US or in other Western contexts um, and the solutions that we might have for those contexts is not necessarily appropriate or just in other contexts. And I think that food is so political in different Global South communities and that there are communities, um, I think indigenous communities were mentioned earlier, and it's, it's not clear across the board, the system of cattle ranching and the system of exploitation of land, of seizing of land, of lack of access to land is disastrous for indigenous communities, but not all indigenous communities are meat free or do not survive or live with and engage with animals in uh, in, in, in different ways. And, and as um, Natalie mentioned, we have different groups of people, pastoralists and different people who live in, in and uh, within different food systems. And a huge issue is the, the influence of um, Western in, industrial um, farming systems and practices that not only punish traditional systems that have worked for quite a long time but make it impossible really for those systems to sustain um, because of the influence of sanctions um, because of um, uh, the kind of incentivization um, on, on financial systems and so yes it's it's we can't romanticize communities that have lived in different ways with food and have found you know, quite uh, sustainable ways of living in harmony um, with their environments and, and have different cultural perspectives around food that make their interactions, even when they do involve meat, much different to the systems that we're talking about, um, because these are being eroded quite quickly by massive corporations. I mean, when you're in Ghana, traditionally people grow a, a high density of fruit and vegetables, plantains, yams that grow wild in, in in forests and do um you know have uh meat as well that's not really farmed as such but they they have that in their diet what you have now is companies like nestle um plastering adverts 
everywhere and saying that this is the healthy food that you should um, buy, which changes people's practices, which moves them away from their traditional ecological, e ecologically harmonious practices um, and focuses on money, money that can buy pre-packaged foods. And then that becomes the main contributor to um, calories in diets and, it, and then the cycle just continues. And so the whole concept of food sovereignty is about communities and in other places working actually in harmony with their land, which might in some cases include animals, whether that's salmon in certain communities, whether that's fishing in certain communities, away from Western industrialized traditions. But that can't happen if the World Bank or, you know, the IMF is involved. Um, this is, 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 is more of a sort of community activist approach to food security and food sovereignty because you know, even when we're talking about vegetable crops, I think we mentioned in the beginning about the, these big organizations, you have organizations like Monsanto, who are trapping farmers into a cycle of poverty and of depression with these, you know, genetically modified seeds that they're only allowed to buy and that they're only allowed to plant. And, you know, that two years later are out of production and they have to buy the next new seed. And so, Western systems, they don't help us in the West, but they really don't help uh, people in the global South who have had systems prior that have been working and then they get sanctioned or they get, you know, penalized by Western corporations who just care about money. So I think that when we're talking about solutions, a lot of this in, in, in other countries, not the UK, needs to actually come from, from, from leaders, community leaders, um, traditional leaders, elders in those communities who do know and who are keeping those um, traditions alive. And there's not going to be one solution for the global food system as we might see it, because that also might not work in, in, in or be the best or most nutritious or most sustainable ways of um, growing and of consuming food in, in certain regions. I would completely agree with everything Jocelyn said there, and she's put it very powerfully. We are shifting very rapidly towards um, what practitioners call the global standard diet. Um, where um, food is becoming locally more diverse and globally less diverse. So um, whereas you know, a generation or two ago, um, um, people in, in different nations or even different valleys within the same nation would be eating very different diets from each other. Um, and often diets which you know work great in nutritional terms, um, sometimes far too little protein and other nutrients um, could be quite monotonous, quite bland, but they were very different. Now we've got a far greater wider, a, a greater range of food to choose from. You step into a supermarket and you see stuff which your your parents and grandparents could never have dreamt of. But it's almost exactly the same range of food that someone on the other side of the world has been confronted with, often produced by the same corporations under identical conditions. And that weakens the, the global food system, but also introduces so many of the problems that Jocelyn is talking about. Now, a major component of that is rising animal product consumption. You know, we, even even in, in East Asia, where people never ate dairy products, for example, we're seeing the boom of, 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 of dairy consumption, often with very deleterious health impacts, particularly people who are, who are not genetically suited to, to, to um, be able to digest milk products. Um, but, you know, this is all part, one component of this, this global standard diet. Now, we in, in the UK, we romanticize the diet of the past, you know, and we say, oh, yes, the roast beef of old England. But actually, um, the majority of people in this country were only able to start eating beef um, as a result of, of, of the, uh, the colonial dispossession of the British Empire. Um, Australia, New Zealand, the Americas in, in particular, uh, vast areas were cleared. Um, to produce beef and sheep. And by the late 19th century, when we had refrigerated ships um, and, and other means of preservation, um, huge amounts of that beef were then channeled and mutton and lamb channeled in, into Britain. And we said, this is the roast beef of old England. No, it was never the roast beef of old England. And the great majority of people scarcely ate meat at all. Um, and and so now people say, well, you know, we can go back to the way things were and we could eat meat less, but, um, you know, we could still eat meat. Actually, you know, in, in countries like our own, we just, you know, we, 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 we can only go there by trashing the rest of the planet. And, and, and that's what, what 
you know, we've done with every commodity and we've done it as much with meat or more with meat than, 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 than with the great majority of commodities. And so, you know, this idea, well, you know, we can, we can have, have um, less and better is, is this phrase which many people use. Um, but, you know, if we're going to really have an ecological transition, we're talking about tiny amounts. You know, you could produce a bit of meat from conservation grazing, um, which um, is a radically different system from commercial livestock production, even from commercial livestock, uh, pastured livestock production, because you're talking about far smaller numbers of animals, which, you know, you can use to create what ecologists call an intermediate disturbance regime, a mosaic of habitats, that, that can be good. But such small numbers that if that was the only meat we ate, only millionaires would eat it. It would become a luxury product. Yeah, and luxury products are not widely distributed. Um, yeah, we don't all eat beluga caviar once a year or bluefin tuna sushi once a year. M multimillionaires eat them whenever they want. The rest of us don't eat them at all. Um, and so this is pure self-deception. And, and, you know, and, and unfortunately, many environmentalists succumb to it. Uh, we, we, you know, we can all have a bit of that. Actually, no, it's just it's such a tiny contribution that that we really can't. And we do have to shift to new food systems, much as that might be aesthetically challenging. Um, but, you know, somehow sometimes we just have to attend to the numbers and just as getting out of the coal industry was extremely difficult and painful and it was done in a disastrous way incidentally we need to get out of the livestock industry in in the rich nations and and we need to do so with a just transition and that's actually much easier to, to achieve than in almost any other industry because already ruminant animals are, are they, they would not be produced at all in countries like the uk if it weren't for farm subsidies so we can redeploy those subsidies to get people to do something very different with that money, which uh, a part of which would be rewilding. Um, uh, whereas in all the other professions which are being massively disrupted, there's no provision for a just transition at all. You take my profession, journalism, no one, no one gives a damn about journalists, possibly rightly so, but we're about to get wiped out. You know, AI is going to trash almost all journalism and no one has got a plan for that. No, no one is even talking about a just transition. Yet, you know, the one the one industry where there is scope uh, right off the peg, a just transition because it's already dependent on public money is is the one that everybody's fretting about. Um, you know, yeah, we should fret about it, but we should fret about everything that's coming our way. We have journalists well represented on the panel tonight. Um, but in terms of George's analysis now, I'll just invite Natalie to come back uh, on this really interesting discussion and then want to move on to a new theme that's uh, popular in the, the Q&A box. Natalie. Well, I just, I just want to reflect a little bit. I mean, George, you've talked about a new system without really setting out what you're talking about, but you've talked a great deal and you were talking about unicellular, um, essentially producing particularly proteins in bats, relying on, on fungi and bacteria, et cetera. I think that's a, a fair, very short term summary. I can see a nod there, so I'll take that as a summary. I guess where, where I would differ and where the Green Party differs is that I think that the systems by which plants um, photosynthesize um, uh, and effectively each one of them is a holobiont. If you take a, a wheat plant, for example, it's a complex of bacteria and fungi. It farms its own system. Um, 30 to 40 percent of what it produces in sugars from sunlight by photosynthesis, it pumps down into the soil to actually manage the, the soil around it. I can get very geeky about soils, but I won't do that this evening. Um, but that is a, a system which has developed over hundreds of millions of years. It's incredibly sophisticated, incredibly rich. And you know, I think we'd agree, for example, the figure I heard from the Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Vienna, that um, a bit of African savannah is 100 times biologically productive as a bit of African farmland. And you'd have similar factors if you ask, you know, if you look into the Lincolnshire, um, before we drained uh, the fens of Lincolnshire, they were incredibly biologically rich and productive areas. And so I want to do it, go back and look back to those natural systems developed over hundreds of millions of years. And I think they can do much better in being productive than a factory, a human produced factory can be. Well, I, I'd, I'd come back on that quite strongly. So, yeah, um, you know, the way we're doing it at the moment is disastrous in ev every respect. And, you know, an arable wheat field is catastrophic in terms of what it's doing to soil. 
the pesticides, the herbicides, the fertilizers leaching off it, all the rest of it. Um, I would love to see a switch towards perennial grains. And there's some very interesting moves in that direction. There's a whole load of fascinating things we can do in arable and horticulture, and it should be done on agroecological principles. But we cannot expect agroecology to be able to supply the rising demand for protein and fat. There's no way it could do so. Um, and we shouldn't try to do so. You know, this is why we got factory farming, because of that rising demand. You know, if we try to, to serve that demand for, for, for protein and fat with, with agroecology, again, we would need several planets. You can only do it through this horrendous factory setting, which is highly efficient. You know, that's why it works. That's why 80 or 90 percent of all the animal products we eat come from it. But it's also an absolute catastrophe in environmental and animal welfare terms. So what I'm suggesting is that we use um, factories which are far more efficient, but without the environmental catastrophe and get past that that awful phase of of of, of human development where we rely on animals in factories or indeed um, the great majority of animals that we currently eat. It's still farming. We're just farming microorganisms as opposed to farming multicellular organisms. But, you know, you're not going to replace animals with wheat. The reason why so many substitutes for meat are so rubbish is that plant proteins have a very different profile to animal proteins. They occur at far lower concentrations than animal proteins do. And they're mixed up with secondary metabolites, the strong tasting chemicals that plants use to defend themselves. If you're trying to make animal substitutes, you wouldn't start there. But microbes have far greater potential for doing this. And my worry is that responses like yours are the knee-jerk neophobia, which has too often plagued the environmental movement. We need to get past that. We, we need to see past something which we instinctively dislike because it's a factory. Um, but to understand the enormous potential that that unleashes. Now, you know, farmers don't call it anymore, but they used to call their, 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 their fields a factory floor. They used to justify the way they treated the land by calling it a factory floor. And, and in fact, there was some honesty in that. You know, a modern farm is a gigantic factory with enormous environmental impacts. But if you can shrink those environmental impacts, and you know, one study shows that um, you, if you have uh, methanol converting bacteria, um, you can reduce the land required to produce protein from the most efficient farm um, 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 protein production in the world, which is soy grown in the US. You'd need 1700 times less land than that, which means 132,000 times less land than you need to produce beef, which means 168,000 times less land than you need to produce lamb. This is the most important environmental technology ever developed because it allows us to do the one thing which is now going to stop earth systems collapse, which is rewilding on a gigantic scale. And it breaks my heart to see the Green Party and other environmental groups standing in the way of it. I will let Natalie come back to that and I'll be interested to hear your thoughts, Jocelyn, because it's, it's good to have a debate in these sessions and there's clearly different perspectives, a bit, not just in this room, it's clearly a debate the environmental movement is having about how do we address these, these major challenges in terms of the weaknesses, the lack of, of, of compassion in our food system and, and the way that it's posing major challenges to our life support systems. Uh, so Natalie, what would be your response there to George's comments? Well, I think I want to go back with starting with something Jocelyn said, which was about the traditional systems. And if we look at, for example, in North America, there was the three sisters in um, North American uh, traditional indigenous agriculture, which was growing together squash, maize and climbing beans. And I've actually seen examples of it, it was over in Shropshire, um, I saw a farmer uh, experimenting with similar systems here in the UK. And of course, what you're actually doing is you're producing both your grain, uh, your vegetable and your protein all together in the one field and they worked to complement each other. And I think George, you and I could sit and have a, have a whole hour and a half debate just on this one particular issue and we, we are talking broader than that. But I think that the, and what I would say about in terms of animal proteins, I mean, lots of the, the vegan foods, um, I think one of the great problems is that we're trying to take um, vegetable products and turn them into something as much like meat as we can possibly imagine. Uh, and what we need to do instead is actually to acknowledge them as wonderful, tasty, fascinating, enjoyable things to eat in their own right. 
and that's a very different kind of concept to, to try to see how much you can make them like meat through all sorts of processing systems, which takes us to that ultra process point that you've made before. So I think we're talking here about a transformation that's based a lot on that traditional knowledge um, of ways in which you can actually produce in the one field a balanced diet. I very much agree with you to pick out points of agreement, perennial crops, um, rather than the kind of soil disturbance, uh, the trashing that happens from, from, from the annualized crops. We've also got to look at the crops. I mean, we have a huge amount of peatland. We desperately need to re-wet that peatland to keep the carbon in the peat because when it dries out, the carbon um, is gassed off. Um, and we need to look at most of the crops we have um, in that global food system you were talking about are actually you know, the wheat um, uh, that's come from the, um, from the Middle East, from dry areas. We're coming back to the variety. I agree with you entirely about perennials. We need to think about what we can grow as food in wetland areas. So we re-wet re those wetlands, which would also, again, be really good for, for the natural world. But just to sort of throw into the mix too, I think we also have to be very careful about the idea that um, the solution to the climate emergency is, um, is a trade-off of nature. And this is something I hear a great deal in the house. Um, the idea is, well, we just keep emitting um, emitting uh, oil and gas, burning oil and gas, emitting carbon that way, and we store the carbon in the soil. We have to be very careful about the trade-off in time between whatever you do in a natural system, whether it's a forest, whether it's a grassland, whether it's a rewilded scrub area. Um, a fire can rush through, as the Canadians are sadly discovering at the moment, in a second, and it's gone. We can't compare the geological timescales of oil and gas versus the the momentary timescales, which there can be in a biological system. Biological and geological timescales are different, and we must not forget that. I, I hope you're not suggesting I'm advocating oil and gas use. <laughs> yeah, spent I, 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 I'm sure you're not, but what I do see is, um, in the terms of the practical politics, is I see lots of lots of Tories and lots of people saying, oh, it's all right, we'll, we rile this bit, and that's going to fix to deal with our other problems and yeah. I think it's no, this absolutely is not a substitute problem. it's not a substitute for decarbonization we now know we've left it too late merely to decarbonize our economies we have to do that urgently but we also have to draw down much of the carbon dioxide we've already released into the atmosphere if we decarbonize everything tomorrow we would certainly overshoot 1.5 and we would probably overshoot two degrees we have to do both it's essential and do both sure. to yes. the maximum I don't know. We can. We, I'm sure we absolutely all agree on that, George. Um, uh, Justin, did you want to come in on this last bit of the debate before I want to, just to take another couple of um, themes from our Q and A box? Yeah, I'll just I'll make mine brief. Um, as a technologist, I, I definitely am not averse to using technology to, um, you know, support uh, some of our largest challenges. Um, I would say that I personally don't believe in silver bullets, so I don't believe that there is one large solution that's going to solve the climate crisis, um, whether that's how we produce our protein, but also just want to bring in the justice aspect from rewilding, just as we have space limits and land limits for food production and that we want to be able to reduce the amount of, of land it takes to produce our food, we have to be really cautious about rewilding and what the 50% um, actually means for people on the ground. We have a, a gold rush that's happening right now with carbon offsetting and with people rushing to buy land that is not theirs, that they don't understand, that they don't have a real connection or affinity with those ecosystems and are not actually working collaboratively with the people on the ground who do. I think there is a uh, risk of repeating sort of colonial ways of thinking about this empty land. We've just got this empty land around the world that we're going to protect, and that's not the case. And so rewilding is a massive, massive solution that we do have, but the way, the pace at which it could happen and the scale at which it, it could happen, when you look at it from a conservation perspective, is not, we, we can't just do that uh, without taking a really concerted effort to make that as just as possible. Otherwise, we don't have a just transition. Maybe we just focus on having just transitions in the UK and the US, but for the rest of the world, their transition is absolutely appalling. Um, and so these conversations are really, they are complex. And I don't think that that should be depressing. I think that this is what it takes. And it's interesting to hear from lots of people about how change can be made on a global scale, but taking into consideration these differences and nuances that make sure that everyone can come out better. I think it's an opportunity not to make 
it more difficult to make change, but actually that we can reimagine and create new worlds that are actually better than, than the ones that we've created right now. So I'll leave on a positive note. I completely agree with everything Jocelyn's just said there. Yeah, thank you. And, and yeah. <laughs> Strong agreement. And yes, um, I think the, the, the importance of international justice as well as um, justice on a domestic scale is, is critical and has to be at the heart of these solutions and thank you Jocelyn for spelling out exactly why that has to be the case. Um, so we've had two questions that have received a lot of interest on the question of land ownership. Uh, so Tom Hyam asks, do you feel land ownership reform is fundamental to realigning our food supply chain, particularly in the UK? Uh, while Paul O'Neill asked a similar question around how we support and move towards a more local and regenerative food growing system through cooperatives. Um, so Paul asks, how do local communities get access to land or the large amounts of capital required to buy the land? So um, land reform, land ownership and how that fits into a more sustainable food system. Um, Jocelyn, do you want to, to start on this? Yeah. Definitely. I think we, you know, we have a massive issue with land access in the UK um, and that a lot of money is also being sort of siphoned off and not coming back into the community from production um, on these privately owned lands. Um, and part of this has come from um, the rewilding community as well. And I do wonder about how we make buying back land um, and the ability to form community organizations how we make that more equitable sorry um that was my spike um in, in in cambridge we do have these sort of community farms um but the the size of them currently the access to a large enough plot of land is 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 quite limited so i think that there is actually so much potential for it and i think there's a huge amount of interest lots more people are talking about this and lots more people are motivated to actually get down and support community farming and to support um, more equitable um, food production, especially within cities and finding creative ways to not just, you know, think about buying large swathes of land in the countryside, but how do we um, imagine different types of farming systems in urban areas? And again, I don't know, AI is quite uh, controversial right now, but there have actually been projects done on AI images of how you might produce food in in cities and, and using that as inspirations for actually building systems. And so, you know, vertical farming, not just within buildings, but outside of buildings on rooftops um, in, in different spaces that are disused. And that also links to property laws and development laws and how loose um, policy is in cities. Um, but as soon as there's a blank piece of land, there's a high rise building going up. And what could we actually be? using this for instead of it going into private you know very expensive inaccessible housing um how can that be used for the benefit of the community that's already there um so i think both city and countryside needs to be taken in, into um consider right thank you george uh, I, I strongly favour the community buyout model, which um, we, we're seeing in Scotland, and I, I would love to see that generalised to the rest of the United Kingdom. Um, it can be great for getting um, a community foothold back in agricultural land, um, but also in, in rewilding land. And the classic example is the Langham community on the Scottish borders, which um, uh, managed to um, um, buy out a grouse moor and is rewilding that on community principles. Um, the community owns the land and it decides what happens there. That's the way we need to go right across the board. We have an outrageous concentration of not only land holding in this country, but also decision making over that land. This is our fundamental resource. We should all have a say in it. Lovely. Uh, yes, well, one of my fun times in the House of Lords is when I uh, get to um, lean forward, looking at the uh, Tory hereditaries and uh, crossbench hereditaries who sit opposite me and say, what we really need is land reform and watch, the, watch them all wince. Um, but you know, seriously, um, I, I did a debate with Sheffield Greens, the festival debate a couple of weeks ago, um, and someone came up with a great phrase, which I've been using ever since, which is the right to farm. Uh, and campaigning for the right to be able to grow your own food, not necessarily a, a large-scale farm, uh, 
And I think that's in terms of urban areas is a huge issue. And um, in fact, we had recently the um, almost never going to win, I don't think, I'm not sure it'll even become law, but the levelling up bill, we actually had a right to farm amendment. It was put down actually not, not by us, but by um, uh, Labour and Lib Dem peers um, and didn't go as far as I would like. And I might may at committee, it's a report stage do something more radical with it. Um, but they were suggesting even just in maybe uses, if land's sitting vacant and someone's planning to redevelop it, why not just allow the local community to grow food on it in the meantime while you're waiting? That would be a very simple, not at all radical step. But I'd like to go much further than that. I mean, I, um, I very much admire the Kindling Trust in Manchester, which trains people to be um, growers of food, um, small scale uh, and small scale agriculture. But their great problem is finding land for the people to, to actually start their businesses on. And so you know, we need to actually give people that access to the 10 to the 20 acres, the market gardens, you know, a ring of market gardens around towns and cities where a huge amount of the food that's on your plate comes from those market gardens. Um, and that requires people to be able to access that land at an affordable price. It requires community gardens. It requires, we haven't talked much about, about growing food in cities. I mean, there was a study done in Sheffield, which is admittedly quite a green city, um, but you could actually, Sheffield could be 123% self-sufficient in vegetables and fruit if you opened up all the land on which you could grow vegetables and fruit in Sheffield. So the land is there. We have to get people the access to it. But also I'll, I'll pick up a point that, that I saw a note flash by in the comments. We've also got to think about and this is George was talking about systems thinking. Um, you know, if we're saying people should have land and be able to grow their own food, they also need time for that. So a long time Green Party policy has been calling for a four day working week as standard with no loss of pay. And if you're going to give people more time to do what they like with their life, um, more time to cook, more time to think about their food, more time to grow their food, then that kind of rebalancing is the kind of thing where the Green Party really brings in that systems thinking. Thank you, Natalie. And um, you may have brought us nicely onto our final question, what will have to be our final question for tonight. So I'll introduce it and then ask the panellists just to take literally one or two minutes each to, to comment on this or any other final remarks you want to make before I, I uh, wrap up. So we've had a couple of questions that address the issue of how um, people, how we as a society can imagine the very different type of food system that you've all talked about. You've had slightly different visions, although you've all had things in common, but clearly you're all outlining something that's very different to where we are now in terms of a food system that really works for, uh, for, for the planet and all its inhabitants and for, for people and health and, and global justice. So how can we help people to imagine a different type of, of food system, asks uh, Bridget McKenzie. And, um, how do we encourage more anticipatory thinking to plan ahead and change systems in readiness? Um, so perhaps I'll ask George to come in first on this. Thanks very much, Adrian. Well, our need to transform the food system is as urgent as the need to transform the fossil fuel or the energy system um, and turn it over onto completely different principles. And some of that means using different sources. You know, just as we need to get out of fossil fuels, we need to get out of livestock products, for example. And there's quite a lot else that we need to get out of too. Um, you know, we need massive and urgent transformation. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's impossible. People will never accept changes to the food they eat. But actually, people have accepted radical changes to the food they eat. You know, we're far less conservative than we tell ourselves we are. There's this motto which goes around, originally coined by Michael Pollan, don't eat anything your great, great, great grandmother would, wouldn't recognise as food. Well, uh, I can't remember my great, great, great grandmother, but I can remember my grandmother. Most of what she recognised as food was just disgusting. It was preserved tongue and lardy cake and tripe. And, you know, I mean, yeah, and most of what I eat, which is actually a far more eco-friendly diet um, and a much healthier diet as well, she wouldn't recognise as food. You know, I might cook a Thai meal one, one evening, a Mexican the next, Mediterranean the next. She would scarcely recognise any of those ingredients as food. So I think we have to get past this image of ourselves as being highly conservative. We're much less conservative across most issues than we tell ourselves we are. But sometimes that image of ourselves overtakes us. And we should be innovative. We should be exploratory. We should be prepared 
to think of other ways of doing things, just as, and the Green Party has been a magnificent global leader on this, we've been thinking about other ways of doing transport and other ways of doing electricity and other ways of, of doing energy and indeed the entire economy. Let's be as open-minded when it comes to food as we are when it comes to all other aspects of life. George. Uh, Jocelyn, would you like to come in? Yeah, thank you. Um, keeping it on the justice theme, I think in terms of changing people's um, perspectives, um, I think it's it's just a start. I think a lot of the time we sit back and are waiting for decisions to be made by the government and we don't want to be convinced until it's happening on a global scale. But if we can start having processes of experimentation in our own communities, um, making small changes in our communities, that's not to say that only small change is going to, you know, solve the climate crisis, but it means that we start living in the future that we're thinking of um, before it's being been made on a global scale. And I think that people have always felt that things are going to be impossible and then they're not impossible. Um, and so it's about each person exploring within their own homes within their own street within their own town what might be possible there whilst at the same time you know endorsing and campaigning for and supporting larger systems of change um you know there's you know been a lot in the guerrilla gardening movement and that is of course the government isn't going to come around and start populating um deprived areas with the tree shade that they need or the wildfire meadows that they need and local communities are just going out and doing that for themselves and I think that less so than a, this is going to change the entire world and more so from the way that we think about change and the way that we think change can be made and the amount of um, agency that we feel that we have because I think a lot of the sort of depression and downing from uh you know doom that comes from the ecological and climate crises is, is feeling that we don't have an ability to make change but i don't think that's true i think a lot can a lot of change can be made in local communities and lastly i just think it's about campaigning for people-centered policies and approaches you know i i just wanted to make a comment um from what natalie was talking about in terms of cities why is it that we plant the male species of trees that don't produce fruit on the side of of, of streets when we're you know planning cities but we don't plant the female um, versions of those trees that would actually um, provide fruits that anyone could pick at any time that's one very simple way of thinking about food production and food access that I I think is easily changed by the people themselves. Thank you Jocelyn and Natalie. Well, I very much agree with everything George and Jocelyn have said, and this is very much about politics, it's about policy, it's about choices. But I do just have to, uh, picking up Jocelyn's point about fruit trees, um, some people on this call might know Councillor Andrew Cooper in Kirk Lees, and I took part in his local parish council, a thousand fruit tree project. And so in one parish, they planted, planted a thousand fruit trees, and the... Um, the idea was, you know, you could be sitting watching the cricket on a summer afternoon and reach up and pick, pick uh, a plum off the tree. To, and that's what you snack on while you're watching the cricket. Um, but I think it's worth saying that where we got now was in no way inevitable. Where we are now with huge supermarket dominance, et cetera, that's a product of the choices that have been made by politicians, by policy in policymakers in the past. With different policies, we can get different kinds of societies. And I'm just going to pick up a point that um, Candy just made in the Q&A, um, should we all be a bit more French? And even comparing ourselves to our nearest neighbours, one of the things that came out during the horse meat scandal, if people remember that, was that Britain eats on average twice as many ready meals as the rest of Europe does. Um, now, we also have the second longest working hours in Europe, and certainly pre-COVID, we had double the average commuting time of the rest of Europe. So what we're talking about, as, as George was saying, we're talking about system say, change. We're talking about a society that works for people, as Jocelyn was saying, not people working for the economy, but the economy politics um, working in ways that enables local communities to create for themselves a sustainable food culture and indeed a sustainable life. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, 
Well, thank you very much, Natalie, and um, thank you to all the panellists for really insightful comments in winding up there and in the uh, fantastic discussion and debate we've had this evening on such a crucial topic for the future of people and, and, and planet, uh, a healthy and compassionate future and tackling some of the biggest issues and challenges of our time. Uh, I just have a few comments to make in, in winding up. Um, and firstly, a few thank yous. Thank you to everybody who's joined the discussion this evening. I, I know it's been a very popular um, topic in this latest in our series of Green Talks. Uh, thank you to our, our panellists, Jocelyn, George, Natalie. Really appreciate all your insights on this critical topic. And thank you also to Julie and Charlotte from our membership team who have set up tonight, uh, organised it in advance and kept it running very smoothly behind the scenes. We really appreciate all that you do uh, to uh, support Green Party members and supporters and, and make these events run smoothly. Um, if you are new to the party, you can join us as a member. Uh, and if you're not quite ready to be a member, but still want to support us, you can be a green friend. Uh, that's a system you can find out more about online. Our friends give a monthly contribution and help to strengthen the green movement and help us to get more greens elected to all levels of government. And you've seen tonight on this crucial topic just how important it is to have distinctive green voices on issues which the other parties would hardly begin to even discuss. We need to have those issues debated in Parliament as Natalie and colleagues do, and the more we get Greens elected, the more impact we can have. And um, so you know, do join us as a member or as a friend. And if you want to donate to us, all the links to get involved are being shared in the chat now and will also be sent to people on email after this event. Uh, and as I say, we need to get more Green MPs elected, more Green councillors elected to bring about the much needed change on the issues you've heard about tonight and on so many others. And we have teams working across the country that you can get involved with um, volunteering. It's our delivering leaflets, knocking on doors, people making an impact at a local level that really delivers those growing number of green victories. Um, so to give you some examples of places where we need help at the moment, um, it happens to be my patch that's at the top of the list to mention tonight. Uh, we have a by-election uh, in Norfolk for the County Council within the target constituency of Waveney Valley where I'm standing. Um, Catherine Rowett, who is the um, former MEP in the East is standing to become a Norfolk County Councillor um, in this by-election and we've got some action days coming up, uh, one on the 9th of July with Natalie Bennett uh, and the other on the 2nd of July with our other Green peer, Jenny Jones and links to those two action days are being shared in the chat um, and of course if we can do really well in that by-election that's a great stepping stone for one of our target constituencies and there'll be other information in the chat about how you can get involved on those dates or others. Um, similarly, in Bristol, where my co-leader colleague Carla Denyer is standing in one of our other target constituencies for the general election, we have a summer special action weekend coming up in July as well, so we'll share a link on that, um, as well as links on our action days in Herefordshire, another one of our target general election seats, uh, and those action days are on the second and fourth Saturday of the month, uh, so the next one is this Saturday. Um, and if you can't make that, there are links to be part of Team Ellie, electing Ellie Chowns in Herefordshire. Uh, in London, we have a council, two council by-elections coming up in the borough of Newham, where we made our first breakthrough onto the council last year. Uh, you can get involved with those two, and we have action days coming up there with Ria Patel and Benali Hamdash joining in this coming week. So links to help with all of those are in the chat and will be shared afterwards in an email going out tomorrow alongside the recording from tonight. Uh, but lastly, I just want to say a thank you to everybody for a fantastic discussion and to everybody uh, for coming along and joining in and for all you're doing to support the party. And I um, hope to see you on the campaign trail on some doorsteps and at future Green Talks as well. Thank you, everybody, for tonight and have a good evening.